Hey viewers, welcome to Practical Dispersions. My name is Nicholas Tito with Vance and Veritas Consulting. This is a webinar series where I'm working with Professor Stephen Abbott to review the basics of polymer particle dispersions, along with some typical challenges in R&D. We'll then introduce HSPIP SF, an app for Windows which lets you quickly and easily prototype new designs for polymer dispersants. We'll give you a walkthrough of the app and then go through a couple of case studies to really demonstrate how the app can be useful for everyday dispersion R&D. In this episode, we start by covering the basics of why particles cluster in a dispersion and how polymers can help prevent this. We also highlight some typical challenges encountered in dispersion formulations. Let's start by looking at why polymers are useful for particle dispersions. Neutral particles, when put in a neutral solvent, tend to cluster because of van der Waals interactions. These are attractive interactions with the strength described by the Hamker constant. As the particle clusters get bigger and bigger, they can eventually precipitate out of the solution. This is called flocculation. Now, one of the ways we can reduce flocculation is by adding polymers into the mixture. Polymers tend to adsorb onto the particle surfaces, and over time, you end up with a structure called a corona. This is just a layer of adsorbed polymers with loops and tails extending outward from the particle surface. This is really cool because these polymer coronae act like micropillows. They're springy, and so when two particles come close together, they act like a pillow and keep the two particles apart before the van der Waals attraction can stick them together. This tends to mitigate flocculation and keep the particles dispersed in solution. Now, this is a very simple picture. Of course, if this worked perfectly in practice, we wouldn't have the science of polymer particle dispersion formulation. So what can go wrong? There are a number of interactions and factors that can cause complications. And here we'll talk about three of them, bridging, depletion, and underabsorption. Let's start with the first one. Bridging happens when polymers on one particle connect to the surface of a nearby particle. The panel on the right shows this happening, where the red polymer has formed a bond across two particle surfaces. This is referred to as bridging flocculation because these bridges actually cause particles to cluster and flocculate, just like the van der Waals interactions. Now, this kind of bridging flocculation can happen in many different scenarios, but it typically gets worse as you increase the length of the polymers. This is because longer polymers are able to extend further out from the corona into the solution and potentially form connections with particle surfaces that are further away. A second kind of problem that can arise in these dispersions is depletion flocculation. A nice way to get an understanding of this is to think of the following playful perspective. The polymers, when they're in the solvent, love to dance. And you can think of this as a kind of wiggling motion where they wiggle their way through the solution. This is ultimately caused by thermal motion. It's the temperature of the system that causes the polymers to move around like this to explore their configurational entropy. So these polymers, when they dance, they don't like obstacles on the dance floor. And the more space they have, the happier they are on the grounds of thermodynamic entropy. Of course, if we have particles dispersed in the solution, they're big obstacles on the dance floor. If you cluster the particles, then you actually provide more space for the polymers to do their dance, and they're happier. All of this is a simple analogy for the polymer entropy, also known as the polymer osmotic pressure. The end result is that the particles tend to want to cluster together to liberate more space for the polymers, and this clustering, like before, can cause flocculation. The origin of this is called depletion. It's actually physically the case where the polymers don't want to reside in the small spaces between adjacent particles, and so the particles at equilibrium actually cluster together to liberate more space for the polymer dancing. This depletion flocculation tends to grow worse as you increase the polymer concentration from a low starting point. However, in some cases, the depletion effect goes away again as you increase the concentration, and this is because the dance floor is simply crowded with more polymers. A final possible complication is underadsorption. This happens when the polymer coronae are too diffuse due to too few adsorbed polymers. In this case, these micropillows we talked about earlier can't really do their job, and the particles will tend to cluster together because the springy repulsion from the polymers is too weak to overcome the van der Waals attraction. Underadsorption can happen when there's too low of a concentration of the polymers in the solution, and it can also happen when the polymers are too soluble in the solvent. If you have poor micropillowing, particles cluster more readily and you end up with flocculation. 
Now, intuitively, this kind of underabsorption happens with decreasing polymer concentration and decreasing polymer length. But it can also happen with decreasing polymer chi parameter going to negative values. This last one is because as you decrease chi, the polymers are more soluble in the solvent relative to their absorption strength on the particle surfaces. So, this is a huge space of parameters. And there are some complicated trade-offs as well. This slide here summarizes some of the key parameters in designing the polymers and what happens when you increase or decrease those parameters. You can see that in many cases, there are actually both good and bad outcomes for decreasing or increasing a given parameter. For example, if we look at the polymer length, short polymers tend to cause less bridging flocculation because they also cause the corona to be less puffy. On the other hand, if you make the polymers real long, you have a much puffier corona, which means a better chance of keeping the particles dispersed in the solution, but you also have an increased chance of bridging-induced flocculation. In the same way, if you look at the polymer concentration, going to low concentrations, we have less depletion effects, but also might end up with thinner coronae. At high polymer concentration, the coronae will likely be large and puffy, but the chance of depletion flocculation gets higher. And then, as we said before, if you go even higher in concentration, sometimes you see less depletion and less bridging. Finally, if we look at the polymer solvent chi parameter, basically an ideal solvent is best because this is the best compromise between the amount of adsorption and the puffiness of the coronae. If you go to the case of a good solvent, you risk the solvent stripping off the polymers. And then for a poor solvent, the polymers adsorb to the particle but tend to be collapsed rather than puffy coronae. Now, these are some complicated trends we've discussed so far, and we've focused just on regular homopolymers. But you also have the possibility of making polymers with different kinds of architectures, and this can be very useful for avoiding things like bridging flocculation. For example, if you use a dye block copolymer architecture, you can make only one block that is sticky. This can attach to the particle surfaces, and then non-adsorbing blocks can extend outward into the solvent as the micropillow part. The benefit here is that this free block extending outward doesn't want to adsorb to particles, and so you drastically reduce the chance of bridging flocculation. Another powerful architecture is a comb polymer. This kind of architecture has a single backbone with teeth attached along the backbone. Like the dye block case, you can design the comb so that the backbone wants to adsorb to the particle surface, and then the strands can be non-adsorbing so that they form a broad corona with little chance of forming bridges to adjacent surfaces. There's also one more notable architecture, which is grafted polymers. This is where you chemically bind the polymers to the particle surfaces, but the polymers themselves can be entirely non-adsorbing. So in this case, you have the benefit of strongly bound polymer coronae, but the polymers themselves don't actually adsorb to any particle surfaces, and they don't need to be added to the solvent at all. All right, so if we go back to our space of parameters and trade-offs, we now have an even bigger space of possibilities because we add in the polymer architecture as a fourth parameter. This is tough stuff. So let's recap where we've gotten so far. Particles, when they're in a solvent, tend to cluster and flocculate due to the van der Waals interactions. The primary way to fight this is to add polymers into the solvent, and then these polymers like to adsorb to the particle surfaces to form coronae. These coronae act like micropillows and effectively block the attraction between the particles. However, the polymers are still not perfect, and so flocculation can still happen by things like bridging, depletion, solvent stripping, or underadsorption. One of the ways to try to sidestep these issues is by using alternative architectures, but ultimately, this problem has an enormous space of possibilities, and it's where simple and practical computational modeling can be a huge help. So that's exactly where we will be going in the next episode of this series. We'll talk about how to use HSPIP, a great formulation app for Windows, to quickly prototype and sort through this big dispersion design space in order to test ideas before heading into the lab. Thank you very much for joining and see you next episode.